The AI search engine wars are heating up. Google recently announced its Bing chat GPT competitor, Bard, though users don't have access to it just yet. Meanwhile, if you're looking to try out the new Bing yourself, you'll have to join a wait list. Until then, Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel is here to give us a first look. Bing, didn't think I'd be using that in 2023. I didn't either, Rochelle. So here's the deal. Microsoft's Bing Chat GPT crossover is officially rolling out. And I wanted to show you what it looks like because in some ways at least, it looks a lot like the search experience we're all familiar with. So here's what the Bing integration looks like on a desktop, for example. Now, I'm gonna be real with you, that's a lot of text for me. But now on comparison, let's look at it on mobile, which is a completely different experience. Personally, as a consumer, I liked this one, a be this one quite a bit better. Now, notably, the new Bing isn't available to everyone yet, and there is, as you said, a wait list. Um, candidly, this is still really nascent. And to that end, Google unveiled a slew of AI innovations today for its search, lens, and maps apps. However, you said it, Rochelle, the competitor, the ChatGPT competitor Bard is still only being tested by a small pool of users. Now, looking at this, and this is my opinion, I think it's possible we could be looking at a situation where Microsoft is the first mover, but I don't know if I feel like Microsoft or Google has gotten the user interface or scaling right just yet. And I mean, Google is so far ahead in terms of front of mind for consumers as well. So how competitive can Microsoft really be here with Bing? It's a fantastic question, Rochelle, because, you know, let's, I'm going to give you actually some numbers to really set up the uphill battle that Microsoft is playing right, is in right here. So Bing's search market share is only about 9% as compared to more than 80% from Google. So if search really is the prize here, Microsoft still has an incredibly long way to go. That said, this is the first time in a long time I can remember Bing making headlines. So the search landscape could really be set up for a shakeup. However, there's also another question from Google, which is that how far can Google really push this without coming under antitrust scrutiny? Now, given how aggressive the FTC has been in cases against big tech recently, you have to imagine that's also really a concern here. So there might be a little bit of a gap to let some light in for Microsoft, but the race is on and it's still early. We'll have to see what that means for ad spend. I know there was some concern about potentially Google cannibalizing itself if it does end up coming into this for So we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel, thank you so much. Nothing is free in this world, and that includes Microsoft's integration of chat GPT functionality into Bing's search engine. Morgan Stanley analyst Keith Weiss estimates near-term integration costs of $600 million to $1 billion annually for Microsoft. Silicon Valley's tech giants are poised for a fight over AI superiority. Here's what you need to know. The emergence of ChatGPT has led to an arms race in the tech sector as Microsoft and Google scramble to integrate generative artificial intelligence into their search platforms. Microsoft revealing it will begin using OpenAI's ChatGPT in some of its products, including its Bing search engine, as the company looks to capitalize on ChatGPT's popularity to take market share away from Google. It is definitely a new day for search. Uh, the opportunity to bring and infuse AI and new chat-like experiences with the tools that people use the most on the web today, which is the search engine and the browser, is an opportunity to do something completely new. Just this week, Google releasing its own AI chatbot to compete with the Microsoft-backed ChatGPT. Google CEO Sundar Pichai introducing the newest entry in the AI revolution. It's called BARD, and like ChatGPT, BARD is a generative AI with a conversational interface meaning it can create conversations on its own and provide simple explanations for complex problems. Pishai says BARD will be open to the public in the coming weeks. And of course, China's tech sector can't let American companies have all the fun. Hong Kong-based Baidu also getting in on the action, announcing plans to release its AI chatbot called Ernie in the coming months. All of these companies are still in the very early stages of AI development and are looking at integrating this technology across their platforms and into our lives from search to cloud to gaming and beyond. Let's get to today's morning brief, written by Miles Udlin. Amazon disease. It's what Steve Eisman, who made his name during the financial crisis, calls the investor urge to chase what they see as the next big thing. Today, the big thing is AI. 
Miles joins us here on set now. All right, so Miles, take us into this uh, and the thesis behind what's driving some of the FOMO right now and where AI plays into that perhaps. Yeah, I mean, look, um, Amazon disease isn't exactly like a, a novel thing. I mean, analysts have been saying, oh, where, what's the biggest TAM? So total available market, addressable market, however you want to say it. Um, and you just go for that. So you get a small percentage of a big market and then you have a big company. My point here is just that when we look at what's happening with AI stocks, there can be a lot of like, what's the deal? Why is this happening at all? And I think that Eisman's comments are pretty much like, this is why it's happening. This is why anything happens. Go back in time, uh, look at Rivian a couple of years ago. There's a lot of cars sold. What if they got 1% of them? There you go, you buy the stock. I mean, it's not really rocket science. And you know, there's like a, a sell side diss in here with Eisman's comments as well, which we can leave to the side. But I, I think it's, again, just kind of a very simple way for investors who are confused about why things become hyped to figure out why they are hyped. Well, I also love the tweets that always, like, like whether it's Amazon or any other giant company right now, the tweets that say, if you bought Amazon in whatever year it was, <laughs> yeah. you would be a multi-trillionaire right now. Now, yeah. I think, you know, that sort of feeds into this uh, myth, if you will, of mm -hmm. these kinds of companies. I mean, look, I think you can look at the entire batch of post, honestly, post Facebook venture backed tech companies and look at how they perform in public markets. And I think you could say every one of them is a disappointment relative to the alleged TAM, the alleged Amazon like opportunity that stood in front of all of them. I mean, sure, Airbnb is a big company. I think it's what, $80 billion market cap. DoorDash is fine. Um, you know, Peloton's then okay, Lyft, Uber, et cetera. I think relative to expectations, they're all a disappointment given what we would have said in what we were saying in 2017, 2018. Miles, you've been doing this for a hot, a hot minute here. What ends this activity? Is there just something people should be looking out for? I don't think anything ends it. I think this is just like the framework, I mean, the point of a columnist is you take two different things and you say, here, these two things mean this one thing. So when there are these manias, Basically, this generation of investors is going for this idea. When you say, I don't understand why everyone is buying X, I think you can pretty much back into, well, they think there's an Amazon-like opportunity. They think there's a really big market, and if these groups of companies get 1%, 2%, 3% of that market, then there's something there. Carvana, right, is another. So, like, you can go through the list of every hot stock for the last 10 years, and basically this is the answer, and I don't think they're teaching anything different. I mean, every... Every tech company is now populated by MBAs, so I don't think they're teaching anything different in business school either. So this is pretty much what it's going to be, probably for the balance of our careers. Actually, we'll be old, and they'll change it, and then we'll be like, I don't get it. Awesome. But I just think, look, it's a so useful framework. We won't have framework. to worry about it at that point. Hopefully, we'll be set for retirement at that <laughs> we'll point. We retirement? <laughs> you seen the stock market? <laughs> Well, luckily, I didn't start my career last year, right. so we should, well, that's actually, right. if I had started last year, and anyway, regardless, <laughs> stocks will go up over time, but that's another conversation. Well, I mean, if we're going to live forever, too, we could talk about the metformin and, you know, the Biden thing, like, you know, this is hot in your household. Yes, so, it is very you know, hot in my household, time. Trying, trying to live forever, to live but we forever. will talk about sure. that another time, Miles, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Baidu shares jumping today up over 11% after announcing today its own chat GPT like project called ErnieBot. Could there be a dark horse in the race? I think there absolutely could. So Baidu, it's important to say, has positioned itself as the AI leader in China's tech sector. So it's, of course, they want a piece of this pie. And Ernie is a couple months from coming out, but I think there are a lot of really high hopes, as that stock spike really showed. I also think you can't fully count out Meta yet. They've been pretty circumspect about it. But just last week, Mark Zuckerberg was saying he really believes in generative AI. He's really excited about. And it's something that is clearly going to be important down the line. So I think it's, I think there are a couple dark horses. There may even be some that we don't know about yet. The other thing I do want to say, I love that this got you guys both so fired up. <laughs> Who do you think? That's what I want to know. You covered this thing. One, if I had to guess, I would say Google. There we go. I, think I, I know. Power. I know. But Dave is clearly reading my articles, though, which is <laughs> I, which I love. Um, in the end, I do want to say this is clearly a hype cycle. We don't know how this is all going to shake out, but it's clear something is happening. That's really exciting because clearly we're all excited about it. We are changing the way we live and work. Ali Garfinkel, thank you so much. Tech giants Google and Microsoft are going head to head over the future of AI. Microsoft announcing earlier this afternoon the integration of ChatGPT into its search engine. And then Google is scheduled to hold an event on chat and AI, their own plans tomorrow. So who's going to come out 
on top. Yahoo Finance tech reporter Ali Garfinkel joining us. Ali, what did you think of the announcement that we've gotten from Microsoft today? You know, I actually want to play a little bit of a game with you guys, Shauna. Yeah. You right. like games? You like games? Always okay, so I'm going to lay out the pros and cons of who's going to win here. Microsoft or Google, and you guys are going to choose your fighter. Does that sound good? That Got it. Good. So on Google's hand, right, before we get to Microsoft, it's important to say that Google has already announced its ChatGPT competitor. It's called Bard, and it's important that if search is the goal here, Google is still absolutely the dominant leader in search. It, Google has a search linguistic advantage. We don't say we're searching for something, we say we're Googling something. Mm -hmm. However, Google is already seen as behind on this. I had a source text me this morning saying, Bard screams, we rushed. And I think there's a lot of pressure on Bard to be excellent. And if it doesn't surpass ChatGPT or is at least not as good, it's gonna look pretty rough on them. So that's the Google, that's the case for and against Google. Now, the case for Microsoft. Microsoft is absolutely seen as having a head start here because of their longstanding investment in OpenAI and the fact that they've now already announced this Bing integration. I also think that ChatGBT right now has a linguistic advantage in generative AI, right? We're saying ChatGBT, not generative AI, right? I also think that the world of applications that Microsoft can plug ChatGBT into are pretty obvious. You have the 365, you have Azure, and while Google has that, it's not as well set up of an ecosystem. Now the cons, right? If search is the goal, Bing only has 9% of the search market right now, so which puts Microsoft way behind. And it's also not really clear how much Microsoft's head start will matter. Okay, so those are the two cases. Who do you believe in? I get to go I'll first. I'll let you go first. Go ahead. Well, no question about it. For me, this is Microsoft because of ChatGPT, because of first mover advantage. Think of Tesla, why don't we? Okay, a market cap north of $600 billion where GM and Ford are between 53 and 57 billion. They got to 100 million users in just a few months. That's faster than Instagram, faster than even TikTok. They are already changing the way we live and work. Real estate agents are already using ChatGPT to rewrite their property listings, to write legal documents. It is way ahead of the game here. This isn't about a couple of months. It is, what Ali said, several years of advantage. They made that commitment early and often with billions of dollars. And Satya Nadella said earlier today, it's the most exciting thing he's seen since he became the Microsoft CEO. Your only advantage is it's a verb. Google. That's that all you is, got. And that is a massive advantage. When you take a look at the fact that the numbers that Ali put up there, that uh, that Bing only accounts for ne what nine percent search. Google has more than eighty percent. So that there gives Google a huge advantage. Yes, I would agree with you in terms of the timeline of this. Google's coming out a little bit behind uh, their huge competitor out there, ChatGPT and Microsoft. But you can't count Google out given the past success. In the memo yesterday from CEO Sundar Pichai, he was saying that Google. You, you got to take a step back and think about the wins that Google has already had. And he went on to say that a lot of the technology that is being used in ChatGPT, that is being used in other AI services, was invented at Google. They have a track record. They have a history of coming out on top. They've been investing in AI now for quite some time. They're late to the chat part of it, but I think they're going to be the winner. Our friend Laura Martin would point to you that her note suggests Google has an innovator problem and have had it for quite some time. <laughs> All right, we're announcing today some Microsoft movers. Uh, a major move from Microsoft announcing it will incorporate ChatGPT into their Bing search. Also, CEO Satya Nadella saying at company headquarters it's a new paradigm for search. Joining us now with more, head of Microsoft devices, search at Yusuf Mehdi and tech editor Dan Howley. Nice to see you both, Yusuf. Thanks so much for being here. Why is it, in the words of Satya Nadella, a new paradigm for search? Uh, it, it is definitely a new day for search. Uh, the opportunity to bring and infuse AI and new chat-like experiences with the tools that people use the most on the web today, which is the search engine and the browser, is an opportunity to do something completely new. And today what we've seen is, of the 10 billion queries that happen every day, roughly half go unanswered. You do, basically, you can't get an answer to the question, you try it. We now have a system with the new Bing and the new Edge to actually answer your questions, to let you chat with it, and let it create and spark your creativity by generating content. 
Yeah, Yusuf, I, I want to ask how this kind of differentiates you from the other players in the space, the, the Googles primarily, but also uh, obviously uh, Yahoo, one of uh, the components of uh, our parent company. Uh, any of the others that are out there, how does this kind of help differentiate Microsoft? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of different things we've done. First is through our partnership with OpenAI, we have today announced a new large language model that is even much more powerful than ChatGPT, and it's tuned for search. The second thing is we've built an integrated experience across you know, the web search, the browser, and chat. It's all in one. It's super easy to use. You can talk, talk to it with your natural language, natural voice, and it's now intelligent. So it can assess the page. It can give you things like summaries. It can do things today that you really can't do with any other service. What do you see just in terms of the first mover advantage? Obviously, you are right now a leader in this space. What kind of competitive edge do you see that giving Microsoft? Yeah, being first to market is a huge advantage because the way that you succeed here is you test, you learn, you get feedback, and you improve. And being out here, being first in the market, we're excited to get that feedback to grow. We're, gonna, we're really going to try and innovate. We're going to try and push the envelope on coming up with new experiences that can wow people in their daily life, and we're excited to get all that learning. You know, Yusuf, I, I've been uh, trying it out. Um, I asked it to help me plan uh, a trip uh, to Japan, and I gave it very specific uh, guidelines. I said, you know, I've already been to Tokyo, I've already been to Kyoto. Uh, give me some examples of, of where else uh, I should visit and what I can do. And it did a great job of lining that up. You know, um, obviously, it's something that's, uh, as uh, was pointed out, is limited at this point as far as availability. So I guess for the general public, uh, when can we expect to see more people be able to get their hands on this and really put us through its paces. Yeah, we're, we're so excited to get it out there. I'm glad that you get a chance to play with it because I do think it's an incredible experience. Our plan is to do the following. Today, anyone can come to bing.com and try like 20 queries just to see the magic happening and the sign up for the wait list. Our, our wait list is already filling up pretty fast. And then our plan is to scale that out to millions of people in the coming weeks. So that's roughly how we're thinking about the timing. And then we'll have a mobile version that will also be coming very soon. Bing has about 9% of the global market share in search. How do you presume ChatGPT can change that dynamic? Yeah, the new, the new Bing, uh, which includes these chat-like experiences and the new edge, I, I feel that the first step for us, is, as I sort of said earlier, we have to wow people. We have to just do an incredible job answering questions, and, and we're doing that as, as, as we've been getting out into the marketplace. If that happens, more people will come and try use Bing and use Edge, and then they might use it more, and then that will get then advertisers more interested, and then the whole business kind of goes from there. But our first job is just to delight people. I guess, you know, when it comes to Microsoft overall, obviously there's the, the multi-year, multi-billion dollar agreement, uh, or investment rather, with OpenAI. I guess, you know, this, is this the first step of many uh, where we'll see that kind of technology rolling out into Microsoft's various offerings? Um, do you, and, and, and is there a particular reason why search and, uh, went first? Yeah, it's a great question. First off, you're, you're correct. Our intention is to bring the power of AI to all of the products we do at Microsoft. We've already started a lot with Azure. You can expect that we're going to bring that and improve all of our products. We start with search because it is the largest category in the software. Uh, area. The online advertising market of which Search is a part of is 600 billion in terms of total addressable market. So it's a big opportunity. And the applications that drive that, obviously the browser, the search engine, they're the most used applications on the PC. So we start with the most important area. We also start because honestly we feel that there has not been enough innovation in that space. We think there's an opportunity to address, as I said earlier, the half of questions that just don't get answered. So we're starting there, we've got some great ideas, and we think the, the new services, that when you get a chance to play with it, you'll see how, just how much better it is than today's search. I guess just as a final question, you know, we, we look at search engines, we look at the internet, um, you know, and there's, there's obviously issues that need to be uh, addressed as far as caution. Uh, you know, uh, people may be searching for nefarious things online. Uh, how do you ensure safety? in something like this. I know that obviously uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, there were discussions about that that had uh, some guidelines uh, or uh, guardrails put in rather. How do you ensure the kind of safety when it comes to something so large as online search? Yeah, that, so we do, we, we've taken our approach to safety and responsibility with AI uh, incredibly seriously. In fact, 
we start there before we even start on what we're going to build. We start on how we're going to build it. We've done a number of things. We have uh, AI principles that we've published out. Uh, we've had mesh technology work early on. As it lands in the parts you get to use today, we do a number of things to really put safeguards uh, in place and guardrails so we can understand when people enter questions that might be bad, like hate speech or violence or self-harm. We can catch those queries and we don't answer them. We make sure that when we train the model, that the model knows not to take cues on that. Uh, and then before the answers get served, we ch check them again. So we do, our, we do a lot there to make sure and guarantee that we can have a safe experience for people. All right, you said many head of Microsoft devices in search. Thanks so much. And of course, our thanks to Dan Howley as well. OpenAI's chat GPT is already making its way into different areas of the job market. Yahoo Finance tech reporter Ali Garfinkel joins us how, now to break down how and where it's being used by businesses. Ali. Hi, Brian. So a lot of the reasons and ways we've seen chat GPT go viral have been creative or off kilter in some way. Things like write a love sonnet to my rice cooker or <laughs> tweets that could have been written by Elon Musk. Um, but I think it's also really worth looking at the ways chat GPT is being used today already in businesses. I want to pull out three. We found more. We found five and more. Um, but I think these are there are a couple that are, I think, really worthwhile. The first is healthcare, right? Now, this is a scary thought originally, but the applications of this we're primarily seeing right now are predictable and preventable sicknesses. We're talking colds, flus, eczema, things that your mom has the answers to. Um, importantly, AI chatbots are already being used in healthcare. So we can think of chat GPT for now in healthcare as sort of an enhancement to those. The next one, real estate. This is one we've talked about a lot already. Agents are essentially using it to describe home listings. It's actually, I wanted to pull this one out because it's a perfect example of something ChatGPT is really good at. It's a formulaic writing task. It's exactly the kind of thing that ChatGPT is not only structured to do well, it's structured to do fast. And that kind of brings us to the last thing, which is customer service, which has some overlaps with PR, marketing. These are tasks where efficiency is important and where there is a lot of repetition. It's incredibly formulaic. For instance, if you're writing FAQs or if you have common problems, how to solve them. Now, um, it's important to say for any of these, ChatGPT is not necessarily reliable. Nobody is talking about it as a replacement to humans on the record yet. Um, <laughs> and it should also say that these answers can be stiff or they can be confidently inaccurate. Um, I wanted to come up with some examples for you, and this is the punchline, but ChatGPT was too busy to take my call this morning. So unfortunately, I don't have examples for you. I was disappointed. I thought we really had something, um, but the, uh, they left me with a lovely poem. So I, I believe that will be up on the screen at some point soon. Okay. All right. So as we're waiting for this poem, I, I just got to know, because we're also waiting for this to be monetized by a lot of these companies too. I mean, what that real runway looks like for them to be able to not just introduce these skills to the public mm -hmm. or this generative AI to the public, but how they make money off of it? It's a really good question, Brad, because I think the reality is we don't really know. And I think it's going to vary across industries. For instance, also, there's the time is money argument in the case of the efficiency that something like this would require. I think that's hugely appealing. But I think in the case of healthcare, in the case of real estate, there's so much we still don't know. And that's that's sort of where the nervousness, I think, comes in for a lot of workers, for example. All right. Yeah, finance's own Ali Garfunkel joining us here on set. Thanks so much, Ali. We appreciate it. I actually I think the most underrated number that we got this week was UBS revealing 100 million users on ChatGPT in two months. Now, for context, Facebook renamed themselves Meta, what, almost two years ago? And we still have no idea what it is. We still have no practical use for it is. We have no way to show that it's transformed our lives. And in two months. Chat GPT is transforming the way we live and we work. Real estate agents are using it. If you don't believe me, that's cool. Believe Tim Cook. He says, quote, it's a major focus of ours. It's incredible how it can enrich our lives, adding this gen. It is impacting virtually everything we do. So don't believe me, but believe Tim Cook. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you can't argue with certain, there's a lot of hype around it, Jared. You were, ju you were just looking at individual stocks. So even on an ETF coming out that's capitalizing on this mania that we certainly are seeing around chat GPT. We don't have a lot of information around it, but the ticker will be chat CH. AT will be April focused 12. in a number of areas, but one specifically, the conversational aspect 
of AI, and of course that means chat GPT. So there is this meaning around it. I would likely see that you would think when you take a look at some of the other trends like metaverse in the past, a number of ETFs were launched over the last year and a half that are based on metaverse. So I think AI, chat GPT might be onto something here and we could be seeing a number of new ETFs over the next year. Chat so. 4 about to be released in a few weeks and it's supposed to hook up with Microsoft and Bing. So uh, the enhanced version even coming out uh, pretty quickly here. And GPT Plus that charges 20 bucks a month yes. and promises faster data and actually the ability to get on, which is yeah. difficult From right two now. 2 to 4 p.m. I have a difficult time. Uh, I, I have really struggled <laughs> to, to get access to it. It's been very busy. All right, well, ChatGPT is among the fastest growing consumer apps in internet history. And with nearly 60 million monthly active users in December, it's showing no signs of slowing down. Well, our team spoke to Kathy Wood, ARK Invest founder and CEO, about the latest trend. Take a listen to what she had to say. What I would be looking for a little bit more, and it uh, is how are our companies harnessing AI for their own businesses? Do they have these proprietary data sets? So that's the first thing, because this is going to, AI is going to enable the most massive productivity increase in our history. Well, joining us now to break down the OpenAI computer program is Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel. We know that Kathy likes to do a long play. She, she's usually ahead of the game on some of these things, still waiting for them to pay off. But what about ChatGPT? So Rochelle, ChatGPT is on pace to pass 100 million active monthly users after just two months since its launch. This data is from UBS, and I want to put in some context the company that chat, this puts ChatGPT in. So you know, here you have the months to reach 100 million global mo active monthly users, right? You have Instagram at 30 months, Pinterest at 41, you have TikTok at an incredible nine, and you have ChatGPT at two. Now for context, you think about Google Translate, Spotify, Uber. We think of these as spectacularly successful apps, tech problems aside, and that is an incredibly important part of this. The other key fact here, Rochelle, the total addressable market for generative AI could be over $1 trillion. And ChatGPT is currently averaging 13 million unique visitors per day, which is more than double what we saw in December. So some of this data, frankly, is pretty jaw-dropping. We're seeing applications all over the place. I mean, when you consider just how, how recently we even found out about this company, only a few years and being just two months away from hitting that level. I mean, it really is mind boggling. Now, is there then any company looking to compete with ChatGPT? There certainly are a lot of would-be competitors. Of course, the most famous case of this is Google. Google, ChatGPT has been called a Google killer. I personally think that while talking about ChatGPT as a Google killer is a little overblown, it doesn't change the fact that Google is going to be asked about ChatGPT and its plans with generative AI today in its earnings call. At the same time, from China, you also have Baidu, which is positioned positioning itself as China's top AI developer. So they're reportedly getting in the game and Baidu stock has popped on the news. Lastly, even yesterday in Meta's earnings call, Mark Zuckerberg spoke positively about generative AI, saying that he's very optimistic about it and doesn't want to get ahead of the game, but that it's something he's watching. So Rochelle, there are would be competitors all around, but we'll see who kind of comes to the fore as the real competitor to ChatGPT. I mean, this, this race really is heating up. Fantastic stuff there. Ali Garfinkel there for us. As that buzz, in particular around ChatGPT, has exploded since its late November debut, uh, its capacity to complete tasks like coding, writing content, and entertaining users, it has investors trading the hype, and it's sending both leading and under-the-radar uh, artificial intelligence stocks higher. Our Inez Ferre is joining us now to talk a little bit about that rally, and then we're going to circle back with Kathy in just a moment. Inez, what have you been seeing? Yeah, Julia, and we have been seeing AI-related stocks really skyrocket over the last month. I want to show you on our Wi-Fi interactive board, you will see here. First, I want to show you C3.ai. This company went public back in December 2020. It's an AI software company. Its clients include the U.S. Air Force, 3M, Shell, Bank of America. Take a look, year-to-date, up 92%. Now, this stock had been caught up in the tech selling last year, but 
this year really rallying around this buzz around AI. Of course, on this chart, you'll also see uh, Microsoft, which has invested 10 billion in OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT. You also see BuzzFeed, which last week was up 310% last week after announcing that it would be using AI tools to create content. And then you have some other smaller cap companies like BigBear.ai. This offers products for healthcare, government, and manufacturing. And year to date, this stock is up significantly up 405 percent. You also have this other company called SoundHound. It's a voice AI software company, small company, but nevertheless, year to date, up 14 percent, also getting caught up in the AI excitement. And there are many uses of AI. Uh, there's an analyst over at CFRA Research that talks about cybersecurity and how AI is used uh, with cybersecurity firms. So she was pointing out to CrowdStrike, Palo Alto Network, that year to date, these stocks are up as well. And then we also have to point out that AI has been mentioned during earnings call. I mean, Meta talked about using AI tools to help engineers to be more productive. Palantir back in November talked about Forrester naming Palantir as a leader in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And IBM's Arvind Krishna recently said that AI is projected to contribute 16 trillion to the global economy by 2030. Also saying we have been co-creating with many clients to deploy AI at scale, guys. Inez, really nice work, really interesting overview of what we've been seeing in the public markets. Some of our agents are using this technology to follow up with customers. Not all the people who go into real estate are William Shakespeare, and so they struggle with just composing an email that's grammatically correct. And if you give ChatGPT just a few facts about what's going on with this customer, you get a nice email on the other side. So I think ChatGPT is going to change online marketing just generally. More people are gonna use it to create content when they're not good writers themselves. They're just like my fifth grader who's trying to figure out how to get a term paper done. All right, you need some help selling your quaint charming or even stunning home turn to my new favorite assistant chat gpt residential and commercial agents telling cnn that ai has transformed their job in a very short period of time consider chat gpt has been around a few months they're using chat to write listings social media posts even drafting legal documents for now chat gpt is free for users, but reports suggest OpenAI is considering a monthly charge of 42 bucks. One agent telling CNN he'd pay $100 to $200 a month to continue using that tool. Now that's an interesting question moving forward, much like Elon Musk is considering at Twitter. How do you monetize those people who will pay 200 to the same people that are paid $2 like I would, um, how do you set a price that's somewhere in the middle? But very fascinating trend that agents, I spoke to half a dozen this morning, all of them said, oh yeah, when I asked them if, you're, if they're using Wow, that's Chat fast GPT. adoption. When you think about the fact that we only started hearing about I thought about they'd all say, no way, ago. I don't even know what it is. Exactly, or they'd be a little bit hesitant just in terms of how much they can rely on it. But it is very easy to use. I will say, after you enter a few things, or you try to do it a couple times, you do pick up on the keywords that you need to enter, what exactly the direction you need to give it. But this all goes back to the jobs that ChatGPT could potentially replace. Now, in real estate agents side of it, they're not replacing their jobs is actually helping those jobs. But I think it gets to the point that some of those jobs that are replaced or maybe potentially could be replaced are those mundane tasks that a computer could simply do. There's been studies out there saying that it could potentially, AI in general, could potentially replace up to 70% of the work that gets done in front of the computer screen. Yeah. So that really just talks about how powerful this technology is. And I love it in this case because it's not replacing those jobs. It's helping them better do their jobs and saving time for elsewhere and what else that they could be doing just in terms of maximizing their listings. And that's what ChatGPT told me last week when I asked it if it's going to replace jobs. It said, no, essentially we're here to supplement the jobs and make you help you do them better not buying it entirely. Yeah. Uh, when you look at this, I, I know a number of agents who have an ass has a assistants that do similar jobs to what these agents are telling me ChatGPT is doing. It is not going to take away an agent's job, but those descriptions will take away potentially thousands of real estate assistants. Those are the menial tasks that you don't want to do. When you have AI that's currently free, 
No question about it. It's going yeah. to take away thousands of jobs yeah. as we move But it's ahead. interesting, the uh, monetization aspect of it, too. You're saying that the agents would pay, what, up to $200 a month just to use this. It really shows how valuable this technology yeah, is. Yeah, it can't be free much longer. Yeah. These reports are certainly reliable. I don't know if 40 bucks is a little high. I certainly would not pay that. Uh, I think somewhere around 5 bucks with the average mm -hmm. user. But when you've got people that'll pay 50 bucks, that's the question for them, much like it is for Elon. <laughs> is Chat GPT a jobs killer? Well, who better to ask than Chat GPT itself? The AI told me, quote, it can potentially replace jobs that involve generating written content, such as writing news articles, product descriptions, or social media posts. It could also potentially assist with tasks such as customer service and technical support. However, it is important to note that ChatGPT is not intended to replace human workers, but rather to assist them and improve efficiency. If, however, you prefer a human answer to that question, here's one of the smartest humans we know, MIT professor and author Sanan Aral, who told us it's one of the greatest upheavals in the labor market we've seen in a long time, adding this. It will displace jobs. It will create what's known to economists as skill bias technical change, technical change that favors some skills and complements some skills and substitutes for or competes with other skills. And every time in human history that we have experienced something like this, we've had to reskill and change our focus on what humans did and what machines did in order to create complementarities and increase uh, welfare across the board. So if I'm in college, kids, I'm rethinking what my potential major might be based on what jobs might exist 10 years from now, because rest assured, ChatGPT is coming for your job. Even if it does not intend to, your bosses will wonder, can I replace each of these people with artificial intelligence. You saw what happened in the BuzzFeed stock. Oh, I saw. It's inevitable. <laughs> it is inevitable. It's a little bit scary when we start to think about all of this and of course just what exactly jobs it is going to replace. In terms of the degree of that, the CEO of Automation Anywhere, he was at Davos weighing in on this. And of course, he is involved in AI, so maybe a bit biased here, but he was saying it could replace up to 70% of all the work we do in front of a computer, saying that up to 70% of that could be automated. That really puts it in perspective just in terms of how many jobs could be at risk. And like Dave, what you're saying, kids need to be thinking about kids that are in college, kids that are in high school. You have to have this in the back of your mind just in terms of what that space is going to look like 10, 15 years from now. Because according to some estimates, 30% of US professionals are already using AI on a daily basis within their work. So it's starting to tick up there, just the popularity of it. Now we've got ChatGPT in it. Yes, I'm not so concerned about ChatGPT as I are its descendants. That is son of ChatGPT, daughter of Chat, <laughs> whatever, because uh, if this is not gonna be limited to the realm of just typing and being in front of your computer. These, uh, This is going to be uploaded to lifelike robots. I think everybody is going to have a domestic, or most people are going to have a domestic servant in 10, 15 oh years, goodness. a robot that does a lot of chores, I think we're going to come to realize that we're not that intelligent, we're not that special, and we're really all here just to uh, it's entertain. It's a pretty dire picture. It's a Friday oh, afternoon, entertain ourselves. This is a, this is an up. No, this is uplifting. We're here okay, to okay. entertain ourselves. Okay. All right. And ChatGPT is going to help. <laughs> all right. All this serious work we're doing, lot, 90 percent of this just going to be automated. You know, people looked at the 1950s. They saw automobiles uh, and all these uh, robots coming into their facilities. This isn't going to eliminate jobs. It's going to create new ones. People are going to have more leisure time. Talk about the five-day, the four-day, the three-day, the two-day work week. Guess what? This now is a win-win win for you're everybody. Talking. Come on, pick up your UBI at the local at the local oh, Fed man. facility. On National right. Have Fun at Work Day, Jared just killed off 70% of workers in the U.S. economy. 90. 90% 90 of our daily tasks. Too. Now look, we talked earlier in the program about how many professions are having massive shortages across the country, and the real problem is none of them are the five professions that we put up on the screen that experts do think will see the most impact, and those are education, finance, software engineering, journalism, and graphic design. Those are not the fields that we're suffering from massive shortages in. 
Can they fly planes? Can they be nurses? Can they drive trucks? That's where we need them. Can they be accountants, though? That, I think, might well, be a potential solution. If you want somebody... I feel better about an accountant <laughs> than a nurse. <laughs> if you want an Enron-style accountant, yeah, you're going to have to go to a human. <laughs> ChatGPT, not wired to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> Well, sticking with chat, GBT, talking about exper experimenting with it, figuring out how it works. We are going to take a closer look at this and then also about the information it spits out. We want to bring in tech reporter Ali Garfinkel. And Ali, you did just this. You had a conversation with chat, GPT. You interviewed chat, GPT. What was it like? I did, Shauna. You know, as, as this has been going viral, people have been fascinated, obsessed, scared. I have been all three of those things. So I decided to ask it why. Um, I should say others have done interviews with ChatGPT, but I had some questions of my own. It, it got pretty existential, but I wanted to just draw out three things that were really striking through the process. The first, number one, is actually pretty simple. ChatGPT can't be on or off the record. This actually caught me a little bit by surprise. I was like, well, technically I'm defying my programming. Can I publish this if it's not on the record? The conclusion I came to, as you can tell, is yes, but it certainly presents other problems. Like for instance, I think I, what I was expecting was that it would say, I am always on the record. I am a machine learning model. Though as it turns out, it can be neither. The second thing that was really striking was that to get good answers, you need to learn to talk to ChatGPT. We can't just talk to ChatGPT and say, hey, why are we fascinated by you? Or, hey, what do you think of this? Um, it's not going to give you personality. It's not going to tell you what it thinks unless you give it a little bit more color or unless you tell it what personality to give you. The, same, the way a human would say, bring you personality, whether you liked it or not, ChatGPT will actually respond to the personality you ask it for. Um, since Shauna, I know you love Reese Witherspoon. I asked it I to impersonate L Woods seeing ChatGPT for the first time. And this is what it came back with. Um, it features phrases like, you got this. Um, and it's like your part, it's like your pink highlights bend, bend and snap. <laughs> it was it was really cute. It was really cute. I was charmed by it. Um, but that said, despite our, the third thing that's important here is that despite our, how impressed we are with some of the creative work ChatGPT was, I actually found its limitations to be substantial, particularly when it comes to these kind of creative tasks. For instance, it's not putting songwriters out of business anytime soon. I've had it do a couple of songs, but in this particular case, I asked it to provide the lyrics to a song by The Clash, and it couldn't complete the response. Actually, to date, it is the only thing I have asked ChatGPT where it couldn't give me that response. So though there's a lot about ChatGPT that is awesome, is interesting, um, it's certainly not the easiest interview I've ever done. And, and you had that chat GPD answer a question on my behalf. What was that? How'd it go? I has I, you were interested in asking about the jobs question. What kind of jobs chat GPT is possibly coming for? And chat GPT was a little defensive. What it was saying is these are jobs I can help with. These are jobs I can assist with. But it said it was not coming for those jobs. However, I actually have run this response by an expert who disagrees. He says that there are actually implications for call center jobs, knowledge jobs, entry level jobs. What we're seeing here, Dave, is chat GPT spouting the party line, as it were. And I really like this question because it gets at the crux of why we're so fascinated. We're, we're afraid of how it's going to reshuffle our world. We're fascinated and we're afraid, we're afraid and we're fascinated. And I don't expect that to stop anytime soon. We need a him or a her. I, like, I, I don't believe it. Uh, I believe it is coming for all of our jobs, Ali Garfinkel, but uh, I'm old. Yours so too? We're, I worry for you young people, not us old ones. <laughs> Ali, thanks so much. Well, it's a big week for tech as Microsoft earnings kicks things off with a less than desired outcome as its worrisome guidance hits other mega tech names. We're here to dig deeper on Microsoft and the rest of the tech space is Robert Stimson, Oak Associates co-CIO. Good to see you, Robert. So as we were taking a look through some of the revenue drivers there for Microsoft, Azure stood out. And we know that, that you said that that's one to watch, but obviously getting a lot of the headlines is that investment in open AI. If you're Microsoft, how should you be putting your capital to work right now? Well, we think the open AI investment into chat uh, GPT it is the type of decision you want to see from a mega cap tech name like Microsoft. We do not want to see them uh, sacrifice those opportunities to the likes of Google or Amazon or Facebook. 
Um, so we're encouraged by that sort of investment um, for the future. And so as we look at Azure especially and, and where it's going from here, and then when you compare it to what we're seeing with the cloud business, some of these growth drivers that allow them to be able to pour innovation into these other sectors, what are your expectations for the cloud business? Well, the cloud is certainly the growth business for Microsoft. And when we look at the stock today, you know, it's really a tale of two cities. They have the PC business, which is slowing and mature, and then they have growth in the cloud business. And, uh, you know, that's definitely the area that the, the, the market is watching. It's been successful. And a little softening going forward is to be expected, because after all, this is a, you know, a $52 billion revenue uh, company. Uh, it's hard to maintain that revenue growth. And I understand that businesses are kind of uh, rationalizing their spend after two years of trying to be more efficient, more productive coming out of COVID. And so, Robert, then I know that one of the negatives that you highlighted was the current valuation, especially when you look at, say, a Google or a Meta. How, how are you, um, when you think of where the valuations might go from here, what do you think might actually work in Microsoft's favor since they don't do still have such a high valuation? Well, I think they've been benefiting from the idea that that as a mega cap tech company, there is some safety and security in their in their size and their market cap. But when you when you separate Microsoft into those two industries of being a legacy PC company and a growth cloud company, the valuation multiple should probably somewhere in between of those two businesses. And unfortunately, it's not. It's definitely more towards the higher end at 24 times uh, next year's earnings. Uh, price to sales of almost nine times, uh, those are pretty rich multiples when other tech names have similar growth opportunities, uh, but are trading at much more reasonable valuations. You know, whether it's Google at 18 times earnings or Facebook at 13 times earnings, uh, other mega cap names just don't have that premium. And we think that the upside is still good in those areas. And so when we look at some of the issues that were still dragging in from 2022, the macroeconomic back down, Fed continuing to tighten, albeit at a slower pace. When you look at some of the perhaps the potential for the biggest winners this earnings season in tech, who stands out to you? Well, we do like the semiconductor space. Um, people forget it's a boom and bust cycle in semiconductors. And, uh, you know, we had some supply disruptions during the pandemic, um, but valuations have contracted sharply. China is reopening. The appetite for semiconductors is still very strong. So, uh, you know, as an industry, uh, there's some inventory that needs to be worked off in some of the more um, industrial, automotive, and PC names, but it's still a growth industry that you can get access to at a much more reasonable valuation, knowing that it has a long tail of growth behind it. And Robert, I want to ask you about, about layoffs. Obviously, we've seen Microsoft part of that as well with its own set of, of 10,000 layoffs. Haven't heard anything from Apple yet. Apple have done hiring freezes, but haven't made those cuts yet. Do we expect much deeper cuts overall for tech? And why do you think we haven't seen it for Apple yet? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I expect we probably will at some point. Um, all of the tech companies were aggressive in hiring during the pandemic. Uh, they kind of benefited from the work from home trade and in enabling other companies to move to a more uh, distributed workforce environment. Um, and there's going to be need to be some rationalization of that workforce going forward. So I think that the, the layoffs we've seen from a lot of the major tech companies is probably just round one. Uh, I think Microsoft hired something like 75,000 people over the last four years. And last year, headcount was up over 19%. Um, so as these tech companies make their own expense reductions, headcount's going to be a big area. And Robert, I, of course, we know that Tesla's reporting after the bell, but I do want to ask you about Musk. A lot of people, especially investors, frustrated about the distractions. You have Twitter, you have the ongoing shareholder lawsuit. How do you think this is all going to pan out for Tesla since it does have some very ambitious production targets now? Well, you know, Tesla has a great product, a great car. Um, but the stock has been very volatile and Elon's personality is affecting its share price. So uh, while the underlying product is good, um, you know, it, the, the high valuation, as well as some significant changes in the competitive environment over the last two years, I think every major automaker now has a lineup of, of EVs available and Tesla is no longer, uh, you know, the best uh, 
option for some people. So given the changes in the competitive landscape, you know, the tech, the stock's been under pressure. Uh, Elon's been a little bit of a distraction. Uh, and as a result, it may not ever receive the premium fan base or valuation that it had enjoyed previously. Certainly is a very different time we're living in now in the EV space. Robert Stimson there, Oak Associates co-CIO. Thank you for joining me this morning. Shares of Microsoft were down pretty considerably early in the day, but now largely flat. And shares of Google down nearly 3%. As we found out, the road ahead for big tech looks a bit bumpy after Microsoft's earnings report. But Microsoft may have the decided advantage right around the next corner. The company betting $10 billion big on open AI and specifically chat GPT. CEO Satya Nadella is saying its impact will be, quote, at the magnitude of the personal computer, the Internet, mobile devices, and the cloud. Sanan Aral is the director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and the author, author of The Hype Machine. Nice to see you, sir. How considerable do you think that advantage will be for Microsoft? Well, I think time will tell, but I think it's an excellent bet. A billion to start, 10 billion to follow on in the investment. And uh, as we have seen recently, uh, it has Google shook a little bit, uh, calling a uh, code red, calling big names back to the company to talk about it, to think about strategy. And there's a good reason for that. ChatGPT is potentially an existential threat to Google's business because Google relies 60% of its revenue on search and ChatGPT offers an alternative to search, which is a one-stop question answering shop powered by AI. Microsoft has been struggling to compete on search with Bing, although they've been doing better over the years, but this could change the game of search entirely, which is core to Google's business. So, Sanan, if you're talking to Google right now, Google's trying to figure out how to get that edge back, considering this massive threat from ChatGPT. What could, what should they do? I think there has to be a combination of investments in external players, as well as internal investments uh, to refocus and streamline their approach to AI. Obviously, Google is no slouch in AI. They have some of the smartest minds uh, in deep learning, machine learning, uh, and statistical modeling. However, their applications of AI have not been uh, competitive with things like ChatGPT. And if you think about ChatGPT and generation or generative models more broadly, we're talking about text and images and even computer code that can be generated by uh, machine learning technologies and after GPT-3, there will be four, five, imagine what GPT-10 looks like. Uh, you could see it replacing all sorts of functions in tech, and that's why it's such an existential threat. Investments externally, investments internally, streamlining and focusing the approach to AI inside Google. Going to transform just about every industry, including education. Chat GPT passed the U.S. medical licensing exam, the bar exam, and got a B on a Wharton MBA paper. You as an MIT professor, how is it going to transform uh, the entire educational practice? I think it is extremely disruptive, but potentially in a good way in that we have to learn to teach differently. We have to learn to race with machines instead of against them, to use the words of Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee. Um, and the New York City public schools were trying to ban the use of these types of language models. I don't think that's the right approach. I think what we have to do is we have to change the way we educate. We have to reskill and based on our education, focus on things that complement artificial intelligence rather than try to compete with it or ban it or slow it down. It's potentially a way to enhance and augment and scale creativity, but it has to be uh, used in a way that's complementary with human skills and that's going to be the next challenge for the labor force as well. Zanon, so talk about real quick just the flip side of it, because there still is, I mean, there certainly is a lot of fear out there just about what this could do, not only to the education system, what it could do for jobs and the broad implications of this technology. 
Well, we're experiencing one of the greatest upheavals uh, in the labor market that we've seen in a long time. You can imagine human history punctuated by several of such transformations, the agrarian revolution, the industrial revolution, and now the information revolution, which is an essentially uh, an accelerated exponential change at the current moment, even compared to 20 years ago with the advent of large language models, scalable machine learning and AI, that is the story of our time with regard to the economy, and it will displace jobs. It will create what's known to economists as skill bias technical change, technical change that favors some skills and complements some skills and substitutes for or competes with other skills. And every time in human history that we have experienced something like this, we've had to reskill and change our focus on what humans did and what machines did in order to create complementarities and increase uh, welfare across the board. And that's what we are challenged with doing today as companies, as policymakers, and as workers. Sanan, it was my hope that my kids didn't really know what chat GPT was. Boy, was I wrong. They laughed, they said all their friends are using it. I'm not sure how, I'm not sure if they're cheating. What would you tell parents? How should we handle this? The fear is our kids are not only cheating, but their inability to form their own opinions is in jeopardy. What should we do? It's funny you ask that. I was gonna say that they probably knew before you did, as I'm <laughs> sure that my 90, my nine-year-old knew before I did. As the father of a nine-year-old, uh, I do not want to scare him away from this type of technology, although we have strict limits for screen time at our house. Um, I want him to play with it. I want him to uh, experiment with it. I want uh, with I want him to understand how to use it. I want him to uh, think about how he might work with it. Uh, rather than try to keep him off of it or to keep him away from it, we have to learn how to use complementary technologies like this to aid us, uh, extend our creativity, to scale human thought. And I think that starts with young generations. Frequently, they're the innovators. We're the laggards. Maybe they should show us <laughs> what we should be doing with it. Uh, certainly, cheating is should be something that you parent away from at all times from an ethical and moral standpoint and that using technology not to cheat but to knowingly and transparently address the technological revolution is the right way to go about it in my mind. There's some great tips there, and Sanan, my kids are a little bit too young, but I will keep a lot of that advice in mind in the coming years. Sanan Aral, thanks so much. Rise of the robots. Microsoft is betting big on AI with its multi-billion dollar investment in chat GPT. But what is it? Yahoo Finance's Dan Kathy joins us now for a breakdown. All right, hit us with the vibes of chat GPT. Dan. <laughs> the vibes indeed. So chat GPT is an AI powered chatbot. Basically, it provides you with human sounding answers to different queries and you can actually ask it a number of different types of queries. Uh, I asked it yesterday uh, how to make a meatloaf. Uh, it's not going to be as good as my mom's, but it was a decent recipe. Uh, or you can ask it to do things like come up with random stories. I asked it to make up a story about a maniac barber who eats human hair and he did it did just that. Uh, it can also answer follow up questions. So uh, if you ask, you know, uh, what is the Bible? Uh, how long is it? It can provide you with some of those answers. It's actually developed by a company called OpenAI, and it's only one of a number of artificial intelligence initiatives that they have going. It was founded in 2015 uh, by a number of researchers. That includes uh, former Stripe CTO Greg Brockman, uh, he currently serves as president, and the current CEO is Sam Altman. He's the former president of Y Combinator. T part of getting that off the ground, though, included a number of investors, including uh, the likes of Elon Musk, uh, Peter Thiel, uh, and AWS. They all committed an initial, uh, an initial $1 billion to get this research going. In 2019, though, Microsoft came in and provided an another $1 billion dollar investment. So uh, they had already been in there. They also at that point became the exclusive uh, computing partner for open AI. So they have that edge in there already in addition to this new $10 billion uh, investment. Uh, Musk 
who I mentioned was one of those initial investors, actually stepped away from the company in 2018. He was also a co-chair for the company uh, because he had been critical of the company uh, and the way it had been operating. He doesn't think that it's being open enough. Uh, despite their name, OpenAI, and the fact that they're uh, a nonprofit. So then what are the risks for something like ChatGPT? Well, the software can be inaccurate, and it can provide answers that are wholeheartedly incorrect. Uh, you can ask it certain answers, and it'll provide them, and they'll just be flat out wrong. And that's just because of the way it's trained. Uh, there are people who go in and look at some of these queries to determine whether they're correct or not, and they try to correct it. But there's only so much so many people can do on such a large uh, platform. The other issue is that ChatGPT was only trained on data from 2021 and before. So if you ask it events that have happened in 2022 or 2023, it's just not going to know that. It's not connected to the web. Uh, the information from 2021 and prior was pulled down and then it was trained on that. So it's not like you can ask it what the weather's gonna be uh, or you know who won the games on Saturday and Sunday in football. Uh, and the other thing is that there's fears that it could start to push people out of jobs that otherwise uh, you know, they would be able to perform without issues. So think things like uh, writing, for instance, um, or some uh, kinds of you know secretarial work. Uh, there's fears that chat GPT, if it continues to develop, could simply take over those roles. And the other issue, and this is something that Musk had brought up, was this was initially a nonprofit company. Now it's a profit capped company where they're only allowed to reach a certain level of revenue. And then the rest of that goes into nonprofits. So there's this kind of change uh, in how the company has been run over time, that's kind of raising some uh, concerns. But obviously not a big issue for Microsoft with that $10 billion investment. And Dan, you'd have to think that this uh, chat GPT will also disrupt Microsoft's own products, right? Yeah, so the, the big thing for Microsoft here is that this could give it an edge over the likes of Google and Amazon, to, uh, as well as Salesforce, frankly. You know, Microsoft competes with Salesforce in the enterprise. If they add capabilities like uh, what ChatGPT is uh, capable of, uh, then it could provide a better overall experience for enterprise customers. As far as Google, it could add the capabilities that you would want in a search engine like Bing. Now, as I said, this is not built for search engines, uh, but the capability to respond to people in a human-like manner, that's something that we could see added to Bing. Look. Google makes up 90 something percent of uh, search engine marketplace in the world. I don't know if Bing's going to eclipse that with just one edition, uh, but you know it could give them a leg up. Uh, and then as far as Amazon goes, if they add these capabilities to Azure, it could make that platform all the more appealing to customers. Amazon's the number one cloud provider in the world. Microsoft's Azure is number two. If Microsoft can really get uh, the edge here, then it could start to muscle out Amazon. So there are huge benefits uh, to Microsoft with this $10 billion investment. And as I spoke to uh, some analysts yesterday, they basically said, look, you know, they made this $10 billion investment after laying off, you know, thousands of people. It shows how important this investment is to them then. Yeah, we'll find this Dan Halley with the analysis. Appreciate it. OpenAI's ChatGPT is smart enough to pass a final MBA exam at the Wharton School. That's according to one of the university's professors. So how does higher education know it's a student or a computer program submitting their next paper? Enter GBT0, the new program created by a 22-year-old Princeton student allows users to copy and paste text and test whether it was computer generated. GPT-0 tests the text and provides a perplexity score followed by a GPT-0 score. That zero score determines whether the text is human generated. In the result, you're watching now the New Yorker article shown was in fact written by a human. Joining us now is the creator of GPT-0, Edward Tian. Edward, great to see you. Bravo. Um, how do you know this is absolutely foolproof and do you get a sense of how prevalent cheating is with ChatGPT? Uh, first, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would say, yeah, GPT-0 was something I built over my holiday break, uh, just at my local coffee shop in Toronto. And I was completely blown away at how it just literally went viral. Uh, it is not foolproof. Uh, yeah, we put a disclaimer not to have any make definitive academic decisions off the beta, 
But what we have done is put up a product vape list for educators that are interested in using it um, professionally. And so far, over 23,000 educators from more than 40 states and 30 countries have signed up for that. So we're really excited. Edward, you make it sound so easy. I think if I was tasked with this, I don't know if I could do this over an entire lifetime, but what was your motivation for this? Because I know you're writing your thesis about AI and you have a lot of interest just about AI and the role it will potentially play in the future. Yeah, for sure. Um, aside from the research and academic interest, I think the concern was the immediate need in terms of education uh, to sort of adopt this technology responsibly, because I'm not against, you know, students using ChatGPT. Instead, I'm actually for students should, and our generation should be exposed to these new technologies, but it has to be done responsibly uh, and fairly, but as well as bigger concerns in terms of bots. I've looked at in the past uh, with, with, uh, with like over an internship with the VVC, like bots, Twitter disinformation, as well as fake news being generated by these texts. That's all of concern. Uh, and we need to have tools and safeguards so these technologies are used and not abused. What are you hearing from teachers? What are you hearing from students that gets you, gives you a sense of, again, how prevalent cheating is with this technology? I would say in terms of from teachers, the reception has been phenomenal. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just back at my high school this Friday and talking to all my teachers and my high, own high school English teacher was telling me that, yes, yeah, students, like they have no doubt that their students are all using this. But what's exciting is some teachers are thinking about also integrating ChatGPT in their curriculum in terms of maybe asking it to help generate uh, writing topics or prompts. So it's the jury's still up in how educators are adopting these technologies because these technologies are here. Uh, we can't ignore that. We have to build uh, the tools to adopt it responsibly. And we're talking about exactly how this works when it comes to detecting cheating or, or if someone, if a human in fact wrote this, what are the certain things that you're looking for in order to alert that teacher, that professor, that this has actually been plagiarized? Yeah, one of the indicators that GPT-0 is looking for is burstiness. A uh, burstiness, in a sense, is variance in writing uh, in terms of, uh, you can think of it that humans have creativity and because our, our short-term memory, we have sudden bursts in creativity and differences in our writing, while machines uh, have pretty ubiquitous and constant writing over time, especially if these machines are as powerful as ChatGPT. The New York public schools recently banned use of ChatGPT. Do you think yeah. districts around the country should follow suit? No, I actually don't believe that's the right approach at all. Uh, first of all, if I was a high school student, I'd just be using ChatGPT on my own public Wi-Fi um, or Wi-Fi at home instead of at schools. Secondly, these technologies are here, and I absolutely believe uh, AI is here to stay. It is the future, and students shouldn't be taken away the opportunity to interact. Uh, it should be adopted responsibly, as well as soon, um, you know, ChatGPT will cost money. So it's no longer uh, just a responsible AI issue, but also an equity issue because students in low income neighborhoods might just never have access to this technology when students in higher income neighborhoods might be paying for it. But if there's a blanket ban, then we actually don't know uh, where it's being used as well. Yeah, certainly many factors uh, to consider here. Edward, when it comes to GPT-0, I know it's only yeah. been several weeks here, but I'm sure you've gotten a tremendous amount of interest from VCs, maybe some larger firms that are showing interest in you and also your product. Have you gotten that interest and what have those conversations been like? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually super exciting. Uh, yeah, those from, from media, being a journalism student, uh, this is like really exciting for me to talk to uh, people as well as being able to talk to VCs. I would say uh, at the moment, we're focused on the engineering and actually building this tool out. Uh, and, and soon, yeah, we're happy to think more on, on the business side. In terms of individual educators, uh, how this looks like is that I'm pretty committed to keeping GPD-0 or at least the copy and paste and hit enter online version uh, free forever. We do want to have a tool that everybody can access because it is an important uh, tool to have. And I think everyone deserves a tool like GPD-0 uh, to 
uh, use as well. Edward, what do you think the, mo the best practical application for this technology is? We've heard theories all over the map, but you've studied it. Where do you think we'll see it develop the best in our economy, in our society in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think like AI generation is going to be everywhere. In fact, I actually use it in my own coding. I use Copilot, which is GPT for code generation, uh, just like ChatGPT is GPT for chat generation. So it's really going to be ubiquitous. I know Microsoft is already looking at uh, implementing open AI models into their products as well. So it's really going to be more and more accessible. Edward, in terms of the advantage that Microsoft now potentially has because of the investment with OpenAI and ChatGPT, is there anything out there from your experience, from the research that you've done, that's even close to where ChatGPT is today? Yeah, I would say um, in terms of uh, like research as well, there's many, many other models that are doing this work, not just uh, uh, like OpenAI models, uh, but there's uh, models in different countries. Uh, there's, I know Tsinghua University has lots of research in uh, natural language models, as well as uh, BERT-based models. Um, uh, so as opposed to these GPT-based models, but I really don't think anything has broken the barrier in terms of accessibility like ChatGPT has. Uh, no other uh, group really comes close in terms of how popular ChatGPT has been used. Just a quick question. Any of your Princeton classmates furious at you for developing this product? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say so. I think it's, it's, it's been pretty awesome. My classmates have all been pretty supportive. Uh, professors as well have been pretty supportive, including my own thesis advisor. They're, they're all pretty, pretty uh, happy and, and proud. All right, I got a 15 year old at home who's not so happy with you. Edward Tian, <laughs> congratulations. Good stuff, great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Microsoft confirmed today it is investing $10 billion in open AI over several years. That brings the valuation for the startup to $29 billion as the tech giant looks to monetize chat GPT. That chatbot has become the talk of Silicon Valley and everywhere else, including Brad's brunch table. The chatter caught the attention of Saz, and that's where we find it. It caught both of our attention in Davos because a lot of people were talking about it. Absolutely. This was definitely the World Economic Forum where, where the next generation of AI uh, took form in large part because of chat GPT. So here are a couple uh, vibes, you know, that I thought about from the weekend as I downloaded everything we learned at the World Economic Forum as it pertains to open AI and, and chatbots like this. First up, you know, it's, it, it is still seen as a helpful, useful tool, at least, at least uh, off the jump here uh, in, in bots like ChatGPT. Uh, I think a lot of execs that we talked to do see a, a strong use case for, uh, for it. And then by extension, you know, because of that use case, it is seen as a major disruptor for many industries. I know if I'm a Salesforce uh, today, which of course bought Slack, there's a lot of, I think, uh, new apps coming that could ultimately integrate it into Slack or, or take market share from Slack if Slack doesn't involve. Just again, using one example, of course, because Salesforce is in the news. And then to that point, likely to see a lot of copycats. Uh, ChatGPT is not, and Microsoft are not the only players in the space. You know, over the next year, I think you will see a lot of apps take things even further in, in terms of uh, technology like this, uh, so it could be used in, in different applications. You know, one person that we talked to at the World Economic Forum is actually, I would say, dabbling a little bit in this space and, and very interested. That is longtime tech investor, uh, Will I Am. He's an entertainer, of course, a member of Black, uh, the Black IPs, but also interested in the space and also putting his money to work into it. Here's what he told us. I think uh, ChatGPT is awesome. Um, I think it's going to be a great co-pilot for creatives. Um, and hopefully it raises the bar on everyone's creativity. Now you have something else that's that responsive. You could push it and it will push you. I think it's awesome. It's like asking a mathematician, hey, what do you think about this thing called the calculator? I'm glad uh, he mentioned calculator and math because the street has seemed to zero in on a company like Chegg. You know, we talked to CEO Dan Rosenzweig at the World Economic Forum, Julie, but they have seemed to zero in on Chegg as potentially being among the first companies to be disrupted uh, in this market here. Brent Thill over Jeffries noting this, uh, the chat GPT could be an overhang on Chegg shares for, for a good bit. Now he tested this app and he says it will be, a, it is a long way away from uh, writing accurate essays or being a major player in education. So it could be something that hangs over the stock, but again, nothing at least near term uh, that might take market share, market share away from a check.
All right, so what's the take? Take is this. Uh, I, I think this stuff is here to stay. I think you're, you're going to see some really uh, amazing applications over the next year. And, and to that point, please save me time. Uh, I'm okay with using this. If I can use it to write or help my daily workflow and, and shave off a couple minutes by the end of the day, maybe that means I actually eat uh, lunch and dinner. I'm all for it. Sign me up. Yeah. I mean, look, here, I, I agree totally, but it's also some of this AI technology and, and even some of the intellectual property that has been patented for more than a decade, some of it at this point has really only been affordable by large right. businesses. And so now, once some of those patents start to roll off, it's going to become more available. It's going to be able to be more open source and available for the individual apps that we might use. Well, and when we talked to Jan Rosenzweig, by the way, he was not overly concerned about AI. He talked about them hopefully harnessing it mm -hmm. in their products instead of being, you know, being disrupted by or com being being a big competitor to what they do. I will say, Saz, if you work hard now and don't eat lunch. AI is not going to change that. Uh, thanks, Lai. Always just neither always. Is look, all, neither is all of my nagging. You're, so if, you're if always my looking to burst my bubble. Do it, AI won't do Here's it. my bubble. You're always looking to burst. You just stuck another pin in it, really. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's what I'm here for. Great to be back. Thank you. <laughs> Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will be staying in her role. Bloomberg reporting that in mid-December, President Biden asked Yellen to remain in her post. There has been speculation that Yellen would leave her position following midterms. Yellen is likely to be a key figure in the administration, and Republicans are forced to battle over the raising debt ceiling. So Janet Yellen, Bloomberg reporting, staying in her role. Dave? Stability, very good. Microsoft, meanwhile, reportedly investing a whopping 10 billion dollars in students favorite homework killer chat gpt let's talk about that with the reporter that broke the story semaphores liz hoffman liz good to see you tell us what you know about this investment and effectively will microsoft become the owner of chat gpt yeah thanks for having me it's good to be here I, I do think the right way to think about this is an m a deal i mean 10 billion dollars is just yeah. magnitudes larger than any venture, uh, you know, single venture investment that we've seen. And so, you know, at the end, it's a complicated deal. Um, we can talk a little about that if you want, but Microsoft will end up owning about half of this company and really sees it as just an incredibly important strategic bet uh, on the future of technology. Liz, let's talk about the details of that deal because it is a little complicated just in terms of how much money they're getting over the number of years and a lot of that tied to performance. Yeah, I should say we don't we don't know everything. We don't know what we don't know, and and Microsoft uh, has declined to comment on this. Um, but it would be phased in over a number of years. It also might include Microsoft had done an earlier investment in OpenAI um, in the form of credits, because the biggest cost, uh, I mean, really the the massive amount of money that ChatGPT spends, it spends on cloud computing, because every time. Uh, to your point, a student tries to get an essay written by by a chatbot, or just like you and me who have found this incredibly fun and addicting, uh, it costs the company like like two cents every time someone uses it. So uh, they're just bleeding money and server costs. So there is some serious cash coming in, um, but you know, for them, uh, cloud credits are, are almost as good. And, and you know, Microsoft too is really buying buying market share for its cloud business, which is the number two behind Amazon. Um, but that's an incredibly competitive business between Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And a lot of these, these big companies who have a ton of cash have actually been using it to make investments. Remember a couple of years ago, Google put a billion dollars into CME, the exchange, um, as part of that. Uh, they were going to move basically their a lot of their cloud computing needs to Google. So these are it's strategic in a bunch of different ways for Microsoft. Uh, you mentioned that ChatGPT is bleeding money, in your words, on uh, OpenAI on ChatGPT. Um, is there plans to start charging for those transactions that you mentioned? I'm always surprised that I'm on there and it's not charging me. If not, what are the practical applications to begin profiting from this technology? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's always the problem with with early stage companies. At some point, they need to figure out how to monetize. These guys have done an incredibly good job um winning the attention game um and so they need to figure out how to flip that switch uh, the answer is there's a ton of applications i mean first of all microsoft you know plans to use this in their software right we've made a lot of clippy jokes in the last the last 12 hours um but but they were very early to that game like i see you're trying to do this can i help you right open ai uh the the code is so good it can help people figure out how to do stuff in excel right so it can really make sort of technical software that microsoft 
uh, sells just like a lot easier and more user friendly, which will help them. You know, but I've also talked to CEOs at, at unrelated non-tech companies who think this can be a game changer for customer service, for client relationship management, um, that kind of stuff. I mean, just think about how many, how much of Twitter is just people like, like standing in line at the airport and tweeting it, you know, angrily at Delta. So there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of applications, you know, I think, and the one we haven't talked about, obviously, is search. Microsoft, you know, Bing has been really an afterthought to Google for a long time. Um, interestingly, you know, like, Google is very good. If you ask it a question, it will come back very reliably with and point you to where you could find an answer. It's not that good at telling you the answer. Uh, it's trying to get better at that. You'll see some of their search results are a little more uh, kind of natural languagey, but they're kind of they're kind of clunky. And so, you know, people really think this could be the future of search. Yeah, Liz, I'm curious just to get your personal take on this because Morgan Stanley was out with a note last month talking about, or I guess, I guess discussing more so how big of a threat ChatGPT could potentially be for Google and its search business. From what you know from all the reporting that you've done, do you think it's going to move the needle there? I'll say two things. One is, you know, this is it's a little bit like we've all been promised flying cars and here we are and we don't have them. Um, this does feel like the next big thing in tech, right? You had the internet in the late 90s, you had mobile in the late 2000s and kind of nothing since then. So, you know, just at a high level, I think this is really directionally interesting. Um, but then, you know, the 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 verdict from the market today. I don't know exactly where they are right now, but Microsoft opened about a point up and Google opened about a point down. And that's $35 billion of, of market value just swung between two tech giants. Um, so, and, and by the way, it's not often you see investors in a company like Microsoft cheer them putting a huge amount of money into like a very nascent technology at an incredibly high uh, price point. So um, clearly the market thinks this is a game changer and, and is, uh, is happy that Microsoft is getting there first. Liz, we haven't heard anything in the way of competition, have you? And what is stopping someone else from getting in this game, it doesn't seem like there'd be a massive hurdle or barrier to entry. That's always the problem with venture, right? How deep is the moat and how big a head start do you have? Um, I guess it really depends on, there's a couple of things, right? Like is computing power now a commodity? Like maybe you could probably argue that it is. You've got the big players, you know, the, the cost of cloud is always coming down. If you had like enough time to, to kind of feed the entire history of human interaction into a, a, a powerful enough computer and you had enough money, I don't see why someone couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't replicate this. I think that's a real concern here. That said, head starts are really helpful and they have a very big one. It'll be fascinating to see where this technology takes us. Liz Hoffman, always great to have you at 7 before. Thanks so much. Microsoft is considering investing as much as $10 billion in chat GPT creator OpenAI, according to Bloomberg. Our next guest says the tech giant's incorporation of chat GPT into Bing could be a once in a decade opportunity to upend Google's dominance. DA Davidson Managing Director Gil Loria joins us now. Gil, make the case for why this could be a once in a decade, once in perhaps a generation investment opportunity for Microsoft. Well, if you think about where Google's market cap comes from, their 1.1 trillion, almost 60% of that comes from their search business. So, uh, and that's because Google search is so much better than Bing. It's 10 times bigger business than Bing. If incorporating chat GPT into Bing makes it competitive with Google search, that's the amount of market cap that Microsoft could take away from Google in the order of magnitude of 600 billion. In the short term, Microsoft is benefiting greatly because all this uh, data and computing power is going to its Azure cloud hosting business. And so it's, it's money that they're investing that's coming right back to Microsoft to grow its most important business, the Azure business. So it's a great investment for Microsoft in a product that could really help it transform its two key products. I mean, Gil, some would ask why Bing even still exists, right? I mean, it's definitely, like also Rand doesn't even begin to cover it. Um, Google's a verb, Bing is most definitely not. So if you could just walk us through in a little more detail, like what would a chat GPT integration into Bing look like and why would it be such a compelling offering? So when you use generative AI like chat GPT and you ask a question, 
you get an answer. You get a thoughtful, well-articulated answer. When you go to a search engine today, whether it's Google or Bing, you don't get an answer. You get a list of websites where the answer may or may not be, and you have to continue doing the work. That really changes the nature of how we get questions answered. And if you've played with ChatGPT at all, you know that it can answer a very wide range of questions in spite of the fact that technology is still developing quickly. So it's gonna, it, there's an opportunity here for us to completely change how we find information. We've been Googling for 20 years and now we may be in a situation where we no longer Google. We ask a question and we get an answer. So you think Gil Bing takes down Google and do you think Google is working on something like this? Oh, absolutely. Google's working on a product called Lambda that should be able to do the same thing. But what we're hearing is that it's not quite as good as ChatGPT yet. And so that's one aspect that gives Bing this opportunity to be competitive and take significant market share. And then the other aspect of this is that Google relies on its current advertising business model for almost its entire business. And 57% of its revenue comes from advertising through Google search. If they were to change the way we do search to start answering questions instead of giving us a list of websites, that would very much disrupt their business. So Google will be encounter the classic innovator's dilemma. Do they destroy their own business in order to stay ahead or do they try to slow down progress? If they try to slow down progress, that gives Bing that inner, um, that inner run into uh, the ability to, uh, to gain market share. How long does it take for Microsoft, if they're successful with ChatGPT, to upend the mind share that initiates every search on Google because of just how long that has been kind of verbified into our daily activity and kind of standard operating practices at, on, on a human basis right now? We're going to find out very soon. Some of the reports out there is that Bing is going to be incorporated with ChatGPT as early as March. And so we're going to see how much better of a product it turns out to be. But if you think about uh, 15, 20 years ago, when we all started using Google, it happened all of a sudden. We were using other search engines. And once Google became better, everybody started using it for everything very quickly. If there is a better search engine out there, if, if Bing plus ChatGPT is in fact better than what Google has to offer, people will switch very quickly. So Gail, putting this all together, there have been reports that Microsoft is thinking about investing more in open AI, which is the parent company of ChatGPT, maybe $10 billion over a matter of years. It sounds like you think that would be a fantastic idea. I wonder what you also think of the idea of if Microsoft just bought it outright. Well, I'm not sure that's a possibility for them. I think gotcha. the, the other investors are, are quite prominent as well. Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, they may not want to sell the whole thing. Um, if, if Microsoft could, maybe they would. Either way, they appear to have exclusivity over the use of these products. They have, they appear, it's been reported that the entire uh, volume of data and compute is going to Azure and that Bing would have exclusivity on using ChatGPT for search. If that's the case, just making an investment should be good enough. There is now a counterplay as well to any type of artificial intelligence, kind of either written product that, that is online or just the, the general framework of how artificial intelligence can be kind of incorporated within writing papers, people who are or students who have used ChatGPT to be able to do this. And now the counter to that is the detection mechanisms to understand what is artificially intelligence generated versus what is not. How much is that a major headwind for the success of ChatGPT in the future as well? There is going to be some cat and mouse game, especially in the field of education where uh, teachers and professors are going to try to figure out if if they're uh, if the student actually wrote the paper. But realistically speaking, the next generation of of this technology, GPT 4.0, that's going to come out later this year, is going to be educated with a, a 10 to 100 times more data than the generation we're now using. Which is to say, when you say write me an essay on this topic, that's one thing. But when you can start saying write me an essay on this topic as if I'm an eighth grader and make some mistakes 
so the teacher doesn't catch me and chat GPT does that, oh, no. it's going to be very hard for teachers to get. That, that is, okay, so that kind of raises the question of whether there is a, a, an ethical responsibility that needs to be layered into how this operates, how, how this artificial intelligence is able to be incorporated, regardless of how good it can be in kind of streamlining search results or simplifying some tasks that are otherwise, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, just onerous. You know, where is that extra layer of ethics within how this artificial intelligence operates? That's a great question. That's the most important question right now. In fact, I believe when using ChatGPT that it's being throttled and governed by OpenAI to not do anything and, and say anything. And one of the reasons Google is holding back on Lambda is specifically that, that once you unleash this and, and give it all the capabilities, it can it might do things that we are uncomfortable with and that we really have to figure out the ethics around and we need to do it now because these capabilities are very, very uh, significant. And so that responsibility right now falls to Google and it falls to OpenAI. And we, we better hope that they're uh, trying to be ethical about it because the capabilities are very significant. Well, you know, big tech has a long history of being ethical, Gil, so we're, I'm sure we're in good hands. <laughs> we'll talk more about that in the next time. Gil Loria, DA Davidson Managing Director. Thank you so much. Really interesting perspective on a fascinating ongoing story. Appreciate it. Well, here's a question for you. What measure is a machine? OpenAI, the research and development team behind viral bots like ChatGPT and Dolly2 could see a valuation of up to $29 billion. This at least according to multiple reports out from the FT and the Wall Street Journal. The developer OpenAI is in discussions with venture capital firms, including Peter Thiel's Founders Fund and Thrive Capital. The bots have recently gone viral for their ability to generate realistic looking text and images. But while OpenAI says it can generate revenue by charging for usage of its products, that idea remains untested in markets. Um, Rochelle, I feel like there's some context necessary here because $29 billion would make OpenAI one of the most valuable U.S. startups. And we're talking about a company, as we said, that has some skeptics who say, like, how do you actually generate revenue out of this? Now, last year, or we should say two years ago, 2021, this is a company that was valued at $14 billion. So we're talking $15 billion over where it is. And of course, this comes at a time when we have heard from so many VCs and startups who have had to slash their valuations because people are growing a little more skeptical about these companies' ability to grow. So in that context, a $29 billion valuation, especially largely based on ChatGPT, which was just launched in November, that's a significant upside. I mean, you want to talk about just a turnaround story. For more than doubling your valuation, in two years and as we mentioned on something that's largely untested and even open ai ceo sam altman saying look there are still some glitches in the technology and as we're seeing a lot of vcs pulling back on investing on some of these sort of riskier businesses we saw that um just in the last in the last quarter we saw that some of these predictions especially from pitch book saying that last quarter marked the first time in a decade the venture capital acquisition deals actually fell below a billion dollars. And so we're not really seeing that momentum. So it's interesting to see so much interest now as people jump onto the, what we're seeing with ChatGPT. Um, now, obviously this could pit you know, Google against Microsoft with this. So it might be a case of sort of fear of missing out and wanting to sort of get in there early. But I mean, these valuations are really off to the races right now. OpenAI, the creator of ChatGPT, is reportedly considering a tender offer that would value the company at $29 billion. This news has garnered significant attention in the tech industry as it reflects the growing importance and potential of artificial intelligence in today's market. OpenAI's research and development in the field of AI have earned it a reputation as a leader in the industry. And this valuation serves as a testament to the company's innovative work and potential for growth in the future. Guess who wrote that? Not me, not my producers, not Shauna, ChatGPT itself. Not bad, ChatGPT. Not bad, it, not, not bad. bad. Very impressive that the technology was able to do that. The one thing I will say is that it's a little bit 
it's much more boring to put it plain here than what you typically write, than what humans typically write, just in terms of the emotion, the feeling that goes into writing right now, the variation. You don't necessarily see that, I don't think, reflected in that script. You read it well, though. You disagree with me. <gasps> I juiced it up a little bit, but serves as a testament. I thought it was solid. I thought it was solid, solid B-plus work. Definitely solid. And I'll give it B-plus. I mean, even give it an A-minus. But I do right, think... What about the valuation? That valuation. $29 billion valuation. Certainly a massive bet, I think, on the future of this company. When you take into account what it's done while well, ChatGPT, the technology here, extremely impressive. Reuters had reported last month that the company only expected to make 80 million in revenue last year in 2022. So $29 billion valuation really speaks to the potential adoption of this and what the future could look like when incorporating this type of technology. Yeah, I'm really curious what the monetizing element yeah. of this is. I didn't pay any money to use this. My kids who have used it quite often, they aren't paying any money. We know they've talked about incorporating it in Bing as search. That's a pipe dream at best. Anybody competing with that Google space just doesn't look, quite frankly, likely at all. Uh, a lot of the students who are using it, th they are not paying for it. And that is an interesting aspect to watch because New York City public schools have now banned chat GPT, not just among students, but among the teachers as well. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use it at home. You can only not use it when you're on their Wi-Fi or on their networks. You might be on their uh, school-issued laptops, for yeah, example. And speaking of schools moving to ban it, I think the big question here is how you regulate it how you keep students from using this to cheat. And it was pretty interesting. There's actually a student from Princeton. He's a computer science student there at the university. He has built an app. It's called GPT Zero. And he's saying that it can, quote, quickly and efficiently label whether an essay was written by a person or whether it was written by chat GPT. It affects it, it, the reason or, the, or I guess the ability here to determine that is the variation that they use or lack thereof that's included in what chat GPT writes. I'm just so impressed that someone has already built an app that could potentially detect this in such a short amount of time. Because remember, this is only launched, what, the end of November? Yeah. Just over a month ago. It is moving at light speed. It Impressive. Is. We shall see where it's headed. Uh, Ali, uh, I think this has implications from everything from the high schoolers and the college kids and how they do their homework to how Google may or may not dominate search in the future. What's coming? You know, Dave, I think it's worth saying off the cuff that this was the year, you know, contrary to the metaverse, right? This was the year that AI really crystallized in the public consciousness. And of course, we have a couple of examples of that, but most of them are from OpenAI, which developed ChatGPT. So it's worth saying just off the cuff, number one, people are interested. That's something that we have absolutely learned this year. So in the case of ChatGPT, right, it can do all sorts of things, right? For those who are uninitiated, it's the most sophisticated chatbot that we have ever seen on the market. You know, and it's like, like, for instance, today I had it write a sonnet about what it expects to see from 2023. Um, it was very optimistic. Uh, I'll let you all. I'll let you all read that on your own time. Um, the, the other thing too, before we talk about the benefits and drawbacks of ChatGPT, though, Dave, is that Dolly was also developed by OpenAI, and it emerged this year. I actually gave it a, a prompt that you guys could see. This is a uh, a corgi on a throne in a blue smoking jacket in the style of Monet. So both conversational AI and AI art really made a dent this year. And as you said, Dave, benefits and drawbacks. Right. On one hand. It could change the search landscape down the line. I'm very hesitant about that in the immediate term, especially because ChatGPT right now is only updated to about 2021, I believe. So anything you asked about 2022, for example, isn't going to be accurate. That said, it's also important to talk about you know, the drawbacks. For instance, you know, one of the big ones you said, fears that it can help kids cheat on homework. But in the end, I think it's worth saying that this has captured imaginations of people worldwide. It's it's facilitated hate, it's facilitated love, and I think there's no doubt everyone's looking around saying, how can we leverage this in tech and otherwise? Capture imagination certainly has captured Dave's attention. He loves talking about it. Allie and Dan, thanks so much for breaking that down. Again, you can uh, read their article on yahoofinance.com. Next big thing in tech, five things that you need to watch in 2023. OpenAI's new chatbot named ChatGBT is gaining online traction as users test out the capabilities of this AI-powered information tool. Here to break it all down with the details, we've got Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel. 
Uh, Ali, to say this is getting traction, I think, is an understatement. My Twitter feed, at least, has been blowing up with people testing this out. What Mine are you too, like? Akiko. Yeah, it's it really it's really blown up. I don't know if I've ever seen an AI tool go quite so mainstream. And there are a couple for anyone who's not as chronically online as you and I are. There are a couple of things that are really important about this. The primary one is this: this is the most sophisticated AI chatbot that we have ever seen released to the general public. And it's it was developed by OpenAI in San Francisco and. Its applications are honestly pretty broad. I've seen the applications range from completely silly, like there's one that went viral about a King James Bible verse about getting a peanut butter sandwich out of a VCR. And you know the applications can also get really scary. For instance, someone figured out how to get past how to get past some of the content filters and get it to tell you how there's a Molotov cocktail, how to make a Molotov cocktail. So the range the range of applications are broad, but there are a couple of simple ones. Some people are using it to clean up their code. Other people are using it to help draft cover letters. You know, there's been a lot of applications surrounding college essays. The way it works is essentially you sign on and you type a question much in the same way you would to something else we're all very familiar with, Google search. So I actually went and tried it out myself. Um, because I wanted to test out this idea because there's a lot of hubhub being like, well, you know, this is something that, you know, could eventually replace Google. And I think there are a lot of things underlying that. But I I asked it a couple of questions that you might ask Google. Um, one of them was very benign. It was about French toast. It might it'll probably show up on the screen here in a second. Here you go. Yeah, I was just like, what's a recipe for French toast? OK, that's a recipe. And then it shows you how it shows you how to make French toast. I also asked it a follow up that gave me excruciating details on how to add chocolate chips in. So I think there are a lot of questions that this poses, but there's no question it has gone completely viral. I, I love this. I'll definitely be checking that out. A big thank you there to Ali Garfinkel for us.